Up next, Sarah Robertson from Grand State Progress came to Kimball Library to tell us about upcoming changes to public education. Sarah Robertson from Grand State Progress here tonight. Um, she's going to be talking about um, some of the key challenges and ongoing threats to public education in New Hampshire. Sarah is the Education Justice Campaign Director for Granite State Progress. She's a graduate of New Hampshire Public Schools and received her undergraduate degree at New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire. She has been deeply committed to the advancement of social justice in her community and state, particularly through the Concord chapter of Showing Up for Racial Justice that she helped establish in 2015. She's an alumni of the 2021 cohort of New Hampshire Le of Leadership New Hampshire, a co-chair for the Manchester NAACP's Education Committee, a trained peacekeeper. That is wonderful. How can I get trained? In that? <laughs> I can hook you up with that. I yeah. love that. <laughs> <laughs> and participates in many other volunteer efforts within her community. She was recently elected by Wards 8, 9, and 10 in Concord, New Hampshire to serve a three-year term on the local public school board. God bless you. Yay. We did have the end in January. Y'all are real nice. Yeah. <laughs> Let's welcome Sarah Robinson. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to try and be as respectful of everyone's time as possible. So if it feels like I'm going a little too fast, Feel free to reel me in if you have questions as I go. Just like to feel free to ask them. It's a pretty small room, so I feel like this can be as conversational as we need it to be. Um, and thank you very much, Michael, for the invitation to join you guys. It's I'm all over the state talking to Democratic committees and having conversations just like this. So first, let's see if I can make this work. So. Just sort of like laying the groundwork, the foundation of what is going on in public education right now. We're all well aware of all of these factors, I assume, that we have big gaps in public school funding. We have the most expansive voucher program in uh, the country right now. We have a statewide ban on an honest education through our banned or divisive concepts law. And we're facing uh, bills every single session of the legislature to further defund public education, privatize schools, and pull kiddos outside of the classroom instead of maintaining the integrity of our schools. Yeah. Uh, when you say honest education, is that the decisive issues? Yeah, that's uh, we use honest education language to uh, push back against anti-CRT or critical race okay. theory hysteria kind of stuff. Honest education meaning the full breadth okay. of an education. So good question, thank you. Do you have any idea approximately how much was spent on the voucher program? Oh God, I think we're at 40 million right now, headed into our second year of it, with 4,000 students utilizing it. Um, only 400 of those having left a public school district. The rest were already in private or homeschool situations. And there are 500 students that have left the program but have not returned to their public schools, so we don't know where they are. Um, anyway, tonight's agenda, I was told that we'd like to have a quick conversation about the legislative landscape, where we are with the minimum standards for public education and ongoing threats to private, privatize our public schools. Um, this, the legislature has submitted their legislative service requests, which is what a bill is before it becomes a bill. Um, of those, 15% of those bills will have some effect, good or bad, on public education. Of those, we know that we have four Freedom to Read bills, which we're very excited about. One is to guard book bans against K-12 through libraries. The other is to uh, stop book bans against public libraries. One is for a committee to study library science's best practices. And the other is, um, what's the fourth one? Um, I forget, I'll come back to it, but it's a most, oh, it's a right of action by librarians who receive harassment at work. So giving them uh, a more finite way legally to be able to protect themselves at work. Um, there's also a bad actor bill. Uh, Glenn Cordelli uh, continues to file an obscene materials bill, which is an overall book banning bill that just makes it very easy to pull books off of a shelf without a full inquiry by a district or library. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, you just mentioned a name there. Who's that rep? Well, Glenn Cordelli is from Wolfboro. Okay. He's on the education committee. 
He uh, is one of the primary architects of just about anything that affects public education. He's a real privatization guy. Um, he does not like me, which I think is a sign of doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> um, voucher program, program expansions are always big every session. Now that we have a voucher program, the goal is to remove the cap entirely uh, for participation. Um, there's also a local voucher program that would, so the current program takes adequacy funding that the state gives, around $4,100 per child. A local fund would take the remaining property taxes dedicated to educating a student and giving it to that family for the exact same purposes that they currently use vouchers. So that can range anywhere from an average of $20,000 per student out of a local district, out of taxpayer dollars directly to families. Um, we're really worried about a local voucher program in our state. Could yeah. you just repeat that, the two different places the money comes from? I'd be happy to. The state provides about 30% of what it costs to educate a student in New Hampshire. The base pay for each student is referred to as adequacy aid. It's around $4,100 per student. You then have state differentiated aid if a student requires special education uh, services or if they qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Um, they just eliminated the adequacy aid or the differentiated aid for students who cannot read by third grade. That was removed in the last biennium or in the last budget session and replaced with catastrophic aid supports for uh, communities that qualify based on poverty levels. So they removed one stream of money to replace it with another that I would argue is not as robust. Um, so that money is currently what families take through the voucher program, that 30%. Your district, your taxpayers pay for the remaining 60%, um, or uh, pardon me, 70%. There's a, a little bit that comes from the feds, but the outsized amount is out of all of our wallets. A local voucher program would allow families to take that big chunk away from your local district. It's a really problematic law. It would bankrupt schools that are in poverty poor towns. Um, all right, so I, I'm like, this is gonna be like drinking from a fire hose and I totally apologize, but there's so much going on in education all the time. Um, we defeated a parental bill of rights for the second year in a row last session and it was indefinitely postponed, which means that it is not, the bill is not allowed to be reintroduced until another budget session. Our budget is done every two years. So this session, they weren't allowed to introduce uh, the forced outing bill. Um, so in order to dodge that, Republicans decided to take the key pieces of the bill and break it up into multiple bills. So we're gonna have a bill that would uh, ban educators from using a student's chosen name and pronouns. So we're gonna be fighting that in the legislature this year, as well as several bills that attempt to um, take away a minor's medical privacy and decision-making abilities, what little they already have, um, and not allowing schools to assist if a child needs medical attention without parental uh, involvement which unfortunately in an emergency situation could be really difficult if you need a parent there to approve every little thing. Um, so there's probably like seven bills related to the uh, forced outing bill that we're looking at um, working against this session. Um, we've got the divisive concepts bill or the banned concepts bill. There's uh, there, every year there is a bill to repeal that law um, it's currently being litigated, and we have, knock on wood, we're, we're pretty confident that we're going to win that lawsuit based on a charge of vagueness of the bill and the DOE not being able to clearly define to educators what is required of them and how they could potentially violate the bill. Um, so because they could violate it unknowingly without any guidance, that bodes well for us from a litigative standpoint. Um, there's also a banned concepts bill that would expand the divisive concepts restriction into higher education, as well as uh, currently we're looking at a tax on social emotional learning, also known as SEL. Um, pretty much every district in the United States offers some form of social emotional learning. It's about working in teams, having empathy for others. It's a progression of anti-CRT moving uh, through Republicans recognizing that um, being racist doesn't work and being 
um, mean to the LGBTQ community doesn't work, so they're moving on to empathy and attacking empathy in schools and in our kids. It's a progression of all the same attacks, trying to create a toxic environment. Um, we also have uh, Education Commissioner Credentials Bill. Commissioner Frank Edelblut does not have the credentials that we believe he needs to be a successful commissioner. Um, so this bill would require anyone who would hold that seat to have a minimum of five years teaching within a classroom, a public school classroom. Um, so we're hoping that we can be successful in that. It's still yet to be seen, but at least we'll be having the conversation. Yeah. Good question about that. Education Commissioner Credentials Bill. Yeah. Um, in order for something for that like that to pass, do we need to have the right governor in place? We need to have the right House, Senate, and governor in place. Currently, we're at a 50-50 split on the House floor. We're at a 14-10 split in the Senate, and that will probably remain that way for the next 10 years based on gerrymandering. And, uh, and the governor is ultimately, if something passes both houses, the governor still has to sign it or wait five days with it unsigned, and then it comes into law without them having to make a clear decision on something, mm -hmm. which is something actually John Lynch was really notorious for. He would just not sign things and let them go into law, which is fine, you know, governors govern differently. Um, but Chris Sununu loves to veto things and loves to make a big show of vetoing things. So we won't have to worry about him very much longer, um, but uh, I'm crossing my fingers we get a Democratic governor in office so that we can make some real productive change if things make it through uh, a Senate that is lopsided. Do -do -do. All right, so ED-306s is a 110-page document that is impossible to read. It is full of legal jargon, and it is the compliance document that all superintendents use to make sure that they're running the schools the way the state wants them to. What your kid eats in the cafeteria, what professional development their teachers can get, what classes you are required to teach, um, all of these things are bound up in this large document. Um, so they uh, are remet every 10 years so that we can make sure that they are up to date. Uh, with best practice, what is best pedagogy, um, that's an arbitrary thing, just the founders of these rules decided, let's make it every 10 years and that way we won't forget about them. Um, it's the, the rules are supposed to make it so that every kiddo who goes to school in New Hampshire gets the same education regardless of where they live, though we know that's never actually happened here, mm. um, but that's the gist. So these rules are in their 10 year uh, interim, and this is a little bit, um, can, can look a little bit messy, but it is sort of the process with which the rule making process follows. So the State Board of Ed looks at an initial draft that was written by a hired consultant. They take the time to read them and then decide if they need revision after a public hearing. This is the way the process normally goes. Um, after the State Board of Ed has a public hearing. Those rules go to the Joint Legislative Committee for Administrative Rules, also known as JELCAR. They make sure that the rules comply with state law. Those rules go back to the State Board of Education with any corrections. The State Board of Ed accepts them as the rules and they become the law of the land. Um, there are lots of problems with this draft. It removes certification requirements for educators. Uh, remove safeguard language for federally protected classes, specifically around um, equitable discipline for students and making sure that you have specific accommodations for different protected classes. Um, it uh, has not included the voices of parents or students or many educators for that matter. Yeah. No, is this step um, proposed now currently? It absolutely is. Okay, I, just, I might have missed that. No, not at all, I didn't say. And okay. thank you for the clarifying question. The current rules with all of these issues are laid on the table by the State Board of Education right now. They've been on the table since March of 2023. They can take them off the table and approve them in this format whenever they'd like. 
Um, however, we have next steps for this. Um, so like I mentioned, parents groups were not asked to participate in this process, um, which is frustrating because those are the folks who are in the mix right now, right? Like they have the best insight into how schools are serving or are not serving our kids. They're a group of people that should be consulted. Um, so here's the timeline. Um, the New Hampshire Department of Education and the New Hampshire State Board of Education are the ultimate deciders. They are an appointed body. They are not elected. Their consultant that they hired to rewrite these rules is Fred Bramante. He's a Manchester native. His organization is called the Center for Comprehens or, I'm sorry, uh, Competency-Based Learning. The 306 rules that we've got a lot of problems with, like I mentioned, were tabled in March. Um, the consultant, Fred Bramante, is compiling suggestions from listening sessions that happened over the course of the spring and early fall. Um, an additional uh, individual, Christine Downing, of her own time and own energy, she's not paid or asked to, but she's one of the original writers of the 306s. She consulted educators over the entire month of August, over 200 educators, and got their feedback. So these streams of feedback are going to be condensed and reported on by the uh, consultant, Fred Bramante. He plans to present those recommendations to the commissioner in December. Uh, December 14th is the next State Board of Education meeting that we expect these rules to be at. However, the next State Board of Ed meeting is on November 9th, next week. So should the commissioner have a change of heart and decide he's sick of waiting, he could ask the board to pull the draft off the table and vote on it as it is. We don't know what they're going to do. We hope they wait until December and that they take in good, act in good faith and take recommendations from the public and implement them into the draft as is. They have proven that they have not done that in the past when the public has had some outcry over please don't cheapen our children's standards. Like implementing PragerU as part of Learn Everywhere is a good example. Thousands of people wrote into the State Board of Ed saying, please don't implement this curriculum option, and they did so anyway. So, uh, like I said, the next meetings happen. They start at 10 a.m. They're at Granite State College on Hall Street in Concord. If you'd like to go and have someone be there with you, I will save you a seat. I'm at all of these things. So, I love having friends join me. Um, ongoing threats to privatization. I know, I said it was going to go super fast. So, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, yeah. Do you have any kind of slide thing or something you could send us if we leave our email? Yeah, absolutely. I okay. can send you all kinds of fun stuff, memos and talking points, and uh, I can send you the side by side of the draft, like whatever you want. I've got all kinds of stuff. Okay. Um, but I could probably like teach a course on this, so mm -hmm. okay. we're limited in time. But if you want to follow up, please do. I would love to just have lots of conversations. Um, our ongoing threats and privatization efforts against public schools include harming funding, like our school voucher expansion, um, with, you know, it says here, no urgency from the governor or either legislative bodies to find a solution to our funding issues, even though we've been suing the state for 30 years and currently have two lawsuits around school funding that are pending um, in the judicial system. Um, Harming honest and inclusive public schools through book ban attempts and attacks on the LGBTQ plus community. Um, also an undermining of DEIJ and B work, as well as SEL. Um, this, we've seen a huge pushback from the State Board of Ed against DEIJ work, which is the diversity, equity, and inclusion work, including them publicly saying in a meeting that they think DEIJ is the most uh, dangerous ideology facing our students today. Ryan Terrell said that during a public portion of the meeting. Um, we have a lack of non-discrimination policies at private and religious schools. Um, and uh, we've been misleading parents about signing away their rights to various, uh, as a result of using privatization measures. Um, you lose a lot of your rights as a student when you move to a homeschool or a private school situation where a public school is legally obligated to meet all of your needs as a student. <clears throat> um, also harming the quality of what we get to teach in our public schools, weakening standards currently through the ED 306s, 
unbundling public school curriculum. So taking away the, when you look at public education, it's a big basket full of options. And people who are interested in privatization want to take those options away and make them something parents are responsible to seek out independently. That's actually, unbundling is a term that the right uses proudly. Yeah, what's an example of that? Um, instead of offering physical education, music, or art in your schools, making that something that you have to seek outside of school time and making parents responsible for coordinating on your behalf. So that's the, the quickest example I could give. Um, we have uh, elected officials and bad actors and vocal minorities creating toxic environments in our schools. Um, all of us have an example of a community member or neighbor that we know that likes to cause trouble at a school board meeting. Maybe it's a handful of them. What we have noticed in our work is they are a very small group of people. They just happen to be very loud. When given the opportunity, communities do show up, and I'll talk about that soon. Um, we do have extreme teacher shortages that are exacerbated by toxic environments, a lack of support for professional educators, and of course, pay scales. So, it's a lot, but communities are fighting back, either electing school board candidates who are <coughs> pro-public school, um, showing up uh, for to either protest or take up space when there is an attempt to ban a book, or um, an attempt to pull back a trans inclusion policy, like a JBAB policy that a school might employ. Um, communities over and over again, overwhelmingly show up to support their kids and support their schools when these issues happen. I've got whole handfuls of examples of different communities we've been really successful in, and we're successful in every single one at fighting back at those attempts. Um, school boards are tightening up their policies, so creating, um, uh, updating their inclusion or discrimination policies to be compliant with state law and also reaffirm their values. Uh, creating uh, clear and decisive pathways for processing if someone challenges a book, and um, making sure that they're as uh, up-to-date in their policies as possible to avoid any kind of uh, lawsuit situation or having somebody be able to sneak in through a loophole. Um, increasing participation in civic life, like dragging your friends to deliberative session, asking your neighbors to join you, making a big show of going to vote and bringing your friends along. Um, and also running for office, participating in your PTO or PTA, coaching, uh, uh, coaching sports, whatever it is that you have as a skill that you can add into your district secures your district from bad actors. Because when we're in there, when we're taking care of our kids and we're taking care of our community, it is much more difficult for people to come in and sow discourse. So, that's pretty much it, I think. That's my very quick and dirty review of public education in the state. This is me, and Lynn's J. Cows is our uh, communications director. They are a marvelous person, and actually are the founder of 603 Equality which is the first statewide LGBTQ plus advocacy organization in the state. So they're, they're the other half of my brain, we like to joke. And Sandra Rice Hawkins is our executive director. Um, we touch on so much more than just education, but that's why I'm here today. So I'm happy to answer any questions. If you have requests for information um, or more in-depth documents, I'm happy, I'm happy to give them to everyone. Thank you all so much. I could talk about this all night, but I know that you have business to get to. So thank you very much for holding the space for me and being willing to have the conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. Yeah,